And hello to Simon. Good. Um, uh, uh, thanks for, for joining us. Um, as many of you will know, it's uh, CHS's 21st birthday coming up later this year. And because we're in lockdown, we're all trapped at home. Um, but I was just so conscious that uh, not all of us have heard the story of how the church was planted. Um, and so I, I, I sought out an otopi. Uh, otopi. Otopi. Simon. <laughs> who's been there right since the start and was part of the part of the planting team for the church. Um, and I uh, was just going to, Simon, you were a captain, weren't you, on a ship? Yeah, uh, Brendan, uh, <clears throat> my um, full-time career was actually to work um, at sea as a um, ship's captain. And uh, I met Anne when we were both working on a mail ship of the Union Castle passenger liners. Oh, wow. Southampton and, and South Africa. And she was what we call a purserette, so the admin side, a gorgeous young lady. And <laughs> I was a young top and working on the bridge. And we sailed together on the same ship called the SA Rania. And she had a sister ship called Edinburgh Castle. And then there were other Union Castle ships. So we met on that particular vessel. And then I came ashore to teach, to lecture. In navigation college in oh, great so i'm very grateful to have simon with us um simon and Anne have been part of the church right from the start um and i was wondering if you could just share something of of how it of how it started up how did how did how did the church come to be down in kirsten yeah good question it might be a bit long so stop me paul you know as we go along um it really sort of goes back in sense to, first of all, the Lord. In 1995, we had something called the Toronto Blessing, a, a real work of God that actually started in the Assembly of God Church in Toronto, which I was fortunate to attend and, um, and visit and spend some time with them. And um, as a result of that particular godly blessing, I pour in, see, uh, Christ Church actually said, Let's actually pray as a church as to what the Lord is actually specifically saying to us with respect to our future, um, the, the, the next step, next stage of our development. And we as a pastorate, the, the sort of eldership of the church, actually felt, and this is in November 1996, that we needed to actually plant. And uh, planting a church is no easy measure, as you will most likely would um, would imagine. So it's actually saying, Lord, if we wanted to plant, where do we plant? With what money do we use to plant? How many people go, et cetera, et cetera, and then a number of questions. So November 1996 arrives. <clears throat> Uncle McLee talks to the church about the church plant, and we don't have a minister. We don't have a building. We don't have even a, a region in which we're going to move to. So lots of questions. Mm. questions. Another event happens in the UK, and we're talking about September 1996, where a young curate uh, from London by the name of Richard Fothergill, some of us will know Richard quite well, and he visits South Africa quite regularly now, and he was at St. Stephen's Church in London, and he actually just felt God was calling him to come to, to Cape Town and to explore church planting without knowing what was happening in the Christchurch. And he, he was told by some friends, go and meet up with this chap called Duncan McLean, his minister in charge of Christchurch, and meet with him and talk to him. And that happened. And ultimately, to cut the long story short, Richard became the first sort of at Christchurch with a particular um, of, won't you help us church plant? And so Richard and a, a small team of people actually then went out to explore where, when, how to church plant. Yeah. So that's the chapter one. Chapter one. Story. Okay. So it was Richard coming down. There was a sense of God doing something here um, at, from Christ Church in Kenilworth and the parish, a sense of call to plant. Um, yep. And then Richard yep. had a similar call to plant all the way from the UK and then came down here and the two kind of... And, and believing that this is where God was 
wanted him to be and to help. And um, so the family of uh, the Fogel family are in the UK. Richard comes here. Richard ultimately meets up with the pastorate. And Uncle McClee said to me, Simon, won't you sort of partner with this particular guy and pray with him and, and walk and talk, et cetera, which I did. Got to know Richard quite well. And then what we did is we actually drove around the peninsula. And we thought because of the, the cross-section of people that were members of Christchurch Kenilworth, is that a lot of them were students. A lot of them were living in the sort of Mowbray Observatory area. Why isn't that possibly a place where we could plot? So we went to talk to St. Peter's Mowbray. We went to my old school, St. George's Grammar School in Mowbray. We sort of did a circuit and bumps all the way around the peninsula, close to the University of Cape Town. And then we started to move down the line, to the South Peninsula. And, and in our trip down there, um, there were four of us in the car and um, Richard actually asked us to stop at a particular stage in Kirsenhof, in a road called Sanctuary Road, which is very close to where we are as a church at the moment, where the building is. And he said, um, I just want you to stop because I really have a sense that God is saying something to me in a vision. Mm. And being given this particular vision in Scotland that actually the Lord was going to do something very beautiful, very miraculous. And what he saw was actually what looked like islands and a sea. And the vision wasn't clear actually where this particular place was until we stopped in Sanctuary Road. And as he looked out to the front window of the car, he said, these hilltops that are around the sort of Constantinburg Lakeside range, he said, that's the picture. And the roofs of all these um, houses here looks like the sort of waves of the sea. And I honestly believe that the Lord wants us to actually plant here. So mm. that was sort of initial indication to us that a location might be right in Kirstenhop. Okay, so that was actually a prayer drive you guys were doing. So we were doing a prayer drive. Seeing that silhouette, you, you had a sense of God saying, this is the location. Correct, yeah, absolutely. And then, um, so <clears throat> we did some, obviously, some lots of discussion, lots of talking to Christchurch about funding, how that was all going to happen, etc. We are now sort of round about a, a November month, um, and um, the budget has already been set. The pastorate have inked in what we need to have with regards to finances for the following year, and um, Duncan and the the uh, treasurer said, "Please don't ask the congregation for a whole lot more money. We simply, you know, are." constrained by this particular budget. So we went to talk to, uh, Richard and I went to talk to the membership of Christ Church you know, at the end of the service, and we said, look, we honestly believe in, in, in a plant. We do think that we actually are going to plant in Kirstenhof, and uh, so we are going to need funding for doing that. And ultimately, I mean, I could come back to just fill in a few more details, but ultimately we found a property that actually was owned by a, an amazing guy uh, called George Sharp. And George owned a company that he had started in 1994 called Party Design. And Party Design were using the building that we use for our family services as his really his storeroom. So if you wanted a party, the Fox family wanted to have a, an Egyptian party. He would bring the palm tree, the camels, and so forth. And, and he would, you know, deck your house out to make it look a little bit like Cairo. And so that was party design. And so George had grown out of this little building. So he was using the, the admin building as his office, and he was using, as I say, the, the other bigger building for his storeroom. And so he put an advert in the weekend August, <clears throat> and he said, for 1.2 million rand, you know, I would like to sell the property. And I saw this little advert, and I, I met with George, and, uh, and I had a real sort of sense, this could well be 
the place that God wants us to start with the church. So I phoned Richard and we came around. We had a, a long and deeper conversation with George. Now, to my knowledge, George then, and I'm not sure even now, faith in Jesus. I think his wife, Corianne, did or has. But I'm not sure about George, and I don't really want to go into that side of his life. But anyway, <clears throat> when we said to him, we have no money, but we have a lot of will, and we trust in God, you can imagine the response from George. As to, <laughs> of course, yeah, of course, welcome, come in. Unbeknown to us, and he told us just only afterwards, you know what actually happened? You walked out, and in walked Times Warner, the Americans. And they saw the same advert. They thought, hmm, we'll buy this property. And they came with a nice fat checkbook and was gonna give, were going to give him 1.2 million, in a sense, on a cash check. Wow. And amazing, he said, Brendan, no. I'm going, to, I'm going to give it to this group of people who have no money, I have a lot of enthusiasm, mm -hmm. and uh, that's who I'm going to give it to. And at the end of that little sort of uh, conversation and discussion, we left knowing that God was doing an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. And we were in the right place, and all we needed to do was actually now go and tick all the boxes. So you can imagine what the pastor of Christchurch felt when we came back and said to them, we're just looking for another 1.2 million. <laughs> I'm sure that went and You know from living up to working on pastor, what somebody says when you say, add another 1.2 million onto the, to the budget. I so, they were very enthusiastic. <laughs> very enthusiastic. You could, you could see the day has come out. Anyway, we spoke to the congregation. We said to them, this is where we felt we were going to be planting, how much we needed. And I said to them, won't you just indicate with a show of hands whether you really sort of sense that we are on the right road or we actually need to stop and, and reflect and mm -hmm. be more careful. And to a person, not only one hand up and two hands went up, and people then responded not only with prayer and with, with faith, actually materially with, with funds, and people bought Bibles and people bought in equipment that we needed and so forth. So it was an amazing response, not only from Christchurch, but from the parish, from the wider Anglican church in this country and outside of this country. Mm. And by the 1st of April of the following year, when we needed to actually give 1.2 million to George Sharp, there that money was, to the very cent that we needed. So it was a great um, a sort of walk of faith, I guess. Mm. We are saying, you know, we're very excited about planting, but we have a whole lot of, of issues or, or matters to address. And, um, and we just really pray that this will all work out and yeah. people won't adversely affect this Christ church adding 1.2 onto their budget or whether it's actually... Um, you know, something we, we we need to be much more more careful about, and yeah. so uh, we on Pentecost Day, the opening, in the service, uh, of the civil church, yeah. as it stands today, almost identically to as it stands today. We just put a big marquee up on the lawn and between the, the church building as it is now and the river, and into that marquee came hordes of people. Interesting thing was. That day that we had a Pentecost uh, Sunday, we actually had rain. And we asked the Lord, will you please actually stop the rain? Because a lot of people actually need to get into this marquee or stand outside the marquee if there weren't sufficient uh, chairs and space for them. And if you were to walk outside of that marquee during the service, you, you would see a ring of cloud around Lakeside. Mm. Musenberg and it rained further up in Tukai and close to the mountain, etc. But it didn't rain at all for the whole duration of that service. And I just had a sense, Brendan, you know, our God is a miraculous God. Only will he find a home for a little church, and not only will he raise the funds, 
he will bring the people of that particular community in and he will protect them in a sense even from the rain mm. that would be desired to um yeah to help so, so it was a wonderful it was a wonderful blessing yeah. now it's really encouraging to hear i have to say simon and i just it really makes me think just in terms of our the, the vision for the life center at the moment and uh yeah. you know, looking at developing that site further and i think i think we probably also feel a bit like uh the the um christchurch bastard sometimes when you look at the sum of money that's needed and kind of go well, yeah yeah um but it's so wonderful it, it is overwhelming yeah sorry I, th I just think it's so important always to look back and remember god's faithfulness in terms of how we've got to where we are actually and that that gives us faith to carry on and i and i do believe that it's it's a faith growing exercise i sometimes just wish god would you know with these sorts of things just give give us the money on a silver platter and go there you go <laughs> yeah that's the easy route yeah and and i think that um you know our knees are meant to be used you know to actually get us into some sort of form of submission before god and say lord we know that you're an almighty you mm. know that you know that you're a creator god and we know you create beautiful things and um We've only got to look around our beautiful city to, to see the marvel of God. And uh, so when you, as a community, pray, Lord, are you serious about us planting? Then help us, please, mm. help us with this whole venture. Bring us to a place. And we, we didn't want a cathedral, and neither did we want to have a, a sort of a very basic tent. But we wanted a little building that had character, that actually a cow shed, which is what it was originally before um, the shops took over, it was a very simple, basic little farmhouse with a, you know, a cow shed. And, um, and before us, there was a church very close to, you'll know this church very well at the bottom of Putter Street, and they, they were going to buy um, the, the area that in Rockall Road that we are now called in CHS. And and, um, and they actually came and did a prayer walk around and ultimately couldn't afford to buy it. Mm -hmm. so they claimed that particular property for God. And so when we actually finally signed over the property to the parish, what we did is we went and talked to all the churches in the area, trying to link ourselves closely with them mm -hmm. and say thank you. Thank you for not only praying for us, but thank you for actually doing something as constructive as a prayer walk around this little property and claiming it for God and you not actually moving in. We have and we want to be, you know, brothers and sisters with you. Yeah. I mean, look, it's been so, so networking is really important. Yeah. And I have to, I've been so encouraged by that just in the a short time because I've only been six, seven years now at CHS. Um, but I've been so encouraged by, we meet monthly with some of the local ministers. Um, yeah. And so that relationship has continued and we're continuing to, I think, work together and see God's kingdom as something much bigger than just one church or another church. Um, and I, I also, I remember I was chatting at, at one of our meetings with one of the leaders there who had talked about um, them prayer walking in the area and and a previous minister praying on the mountain and looking down over the area and just sensing like God was saying on that property, there's going to be a place of worship um, and having a sense that God had something for that place, which obviously as, as your team and with Richard, others came in and had that same sense and God has brought something into fruition there. Yeah. Um, we do that together with others. Mm. And there've been a number of uh, pathetic visions given to us, just two that I'd like to mention. Um, one is that a bell was ringing out from the Rob Crow Road property, and it was ringing out to all the, the community in that particular area of Kirsenhof. And it was a call not to church, but it was a call to Jesus. It was a call mm -hmm. to God. And it was a call specifically to people who had been hurt, damaged, and um, maybe have walked away from the Lord, have walked away from a church and feeling really sort of lonely in a dark place. And this ringing of the bell was actually saying, come back, come back to me. Mm -hmm. Look at 
a building that look at me and come back to me and be fed and watered and nurtured and loved and supported. So the four uh, key words for our mission statement was we need to be a church based on worship. We need to be a church that's based on good biblical teaching, encourage people into the word of God. We needed to have mercy as a, as a key ministry. And we needed to have unity. And coming back to what you're saying about linking up with other churches, communities in the area, it's really important that we're not isolated. We're part of a network and a strong network in the parish, but more particularly in the, in the, um, in the community. Sorry, the second vision yeah. I mentioned one, which is the bell ringing. The second vision was actually of God planting over Cape Town seven posts, seven pillars, and covering from each of those pillars was the canvas covering a tent. And he said, I planted this pillar right here in Kusenhof. This is why, why one of my seven pillars. And he said, I want you to be a light to the nation, a light to, to the city and a light to the nation. And this covering over the, the city is my covering mm. and you to be part of that as a sort of pillar of, of uh, the, the wider church. Yeah. So you be, as you can imagine, seven linking to hold the canvas is key. Mm. I mean, I think that, that first vision, especially so, so powerful about the calling those from the outside in. And uh, for me, yes. the visual reminder of that is always the paintings that we have by Charlie yeah. Murphy of the prodigal son and the prodigal daughter that we have in the church, which is such a beautiful yes. reminder of that. Yes. Um, yes. And I was so encouraged when I first arrived at CHS, I did a lot of talking to people. And one of the things I asked was, why are you here? Why, why do you come to this church? Um, and for so many of the people, it was because they had encountered God in a significant way in that space that they hadn't elsewhere. And for many, it was they'd been hurt or damaged in another church or they'd come from a space outside. Um, and yet here, and I think you mentioned about being authentic earlier as well. It was yes. a big space and somewhere where they could <clears throat> connect with God. Um, and I'm just so conscious sometimes how we do church can actually be a, bar be a barrier <laughs> To coming to God, and I've always yeah. like the church is quite intentional about making sure we don't put barriers in people's way. Yeah, and that's why one of the things that we, as the first pastorate of of CHS, one of the things we we were quite strict about is please don't put into the church building items that actually would actually distract and and confuse, and even the language, the jargon we use in our services, in our sermons, and our in our announcements and so forth, try and make it as much as possible user friendly. So there was even talk about actually what we display on the walls of the church so that it doesn't look like a, a typical sort of mm. church in lost windows and lots of memory boards and crosses and all sorts of things hanging on the walls, but keep it simple, keep it authentic focused on on God and the family was the key yeah you know 50 people come to the first service and we you know we're sitting on rickety chairs we haven't got a carpet we've got rising damp big time in the in the church area we were facing south then we faced east then we faced west as a congregation we have never faced north but we face in every other direction <laughs> and there it was, um, I think that sometimes, Brendan, simplicity is actually hugely appreciated by people, particularly people who've come in into the sort of church building, the church context, and they actually are not distracted by anything else. But actually, they listen and they hear worship and they see how people respond to their God. Yeah. And is, in a sense, much more powerful, I think or I'm saying in first person, for me, it's more powerful. Yeah. Love to hear from others what they think. Too. Yeah. My, my last question, Simon, was just um, for you and Anne personally. I mean, you, you talk about the space with rising damp and trying to figure out where you go and needing to raise all this money. And it sounds like a lot of hard work. 
Like, why, why, why for you two did you, did you decide to get involved in the project and be part of the plot? Well, yeah, that's a good question. I suppose because I linked up with Richard initially when he first came out from UK, and we became good mates. And and as you know, Richard's got an apostolic ministry. And if somebody said to me, what do you think I have got? I think I've got more pastoral ministry. So my sort of sense would be, yo, I, am, I don't want to walk on water. Richard, you walk on the water and I'll stay in the boat. When I'm, I'm a captain, I'm used to staying in the boat, not walking across the water. So getting involved with Richard was actually for me quite a, a test to my faith and uh, just how this whole thing was going to work out. Anne was on the staff at, uh, at Christchurch, um, working with Duncan and a few others, um, John Atkinson, etc. cetera. And, uh, and she didn't want to come to a new church plant. She was very happy at Christchurch, loved the people, as we all do, and, um, and was not particularly sort of enthusiastic about coming. But when God speaks, you have to listen and you have to obey. And when God spoke to her specifically and said, uh, this is actually something really godly and something, you know, you need to get involved in. So that's sort of the human side holding back and uh, God's sort of encouragement to, to on water and move forward. So for Anne, she was actually coming with me. And so with 50 others, um, we came and started this little community which has grown beautifully and obviously we are devastated if we actually have to move out of CHS because it's our family it's our Christian family and so as difficult it was at the start it's now even more difficult to leave mm. no we, we value guys very much I know you've moved further north now and a little bit out of the way but thanks so much for sharing something of your story and something of the, of the history. Well, it's a great pleasure. Um, it's, it's so wonderful, Brendan, just to actually be, in a sense, somewhere near the front of a little group of people that are actually moving with God and to see and to hear and to, and to actually pick up that positive, as difficult as it sometimes can be, to go with God is an actual huge, huge pleasure. Mm. And so, I have written out the story and I'd love to give it to anybody who would like to read, you know, the story of, of the development of, of CHS because it is a good story and we need to tell the story. So you write in actually uh, asking people to, to give their story because it is a wonderful story of God's provision for God's people in, in his time. And there will be a chapter two when this little building gets knocked flat and there's a new building goes up. The really important thing is is the family that is part of that community. That's the important thing. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Would you just, as we close, like to just pray for us um, as a church? And I'm yeah. just reminded of um, where it talks in scripture about not forgetting your first love. And uh, I feel like, yeah. you know, sometimes it's easy to start off with energy and vision for something and along the way start to waft. Um, and I just yeah. think we pray that God keeps us close to his heart and following his voice. Yeah. Father God, I really want to pray that all of us, in a sense, are hearing a story of your goodness, your faithfulness, your love for us, the trust that we need to have in you. As difficult as it may be in this particular time, and we're going through lockdown where the church, in a sense, is dispersed, we still thank you that you are ever present in our lives. And thank you for the family of CHS. Thank you for those people who took the vision and planted and grew. And today, 50 odd years later, we have got a community of people who really love and trust you day by day, week by week, month by month. And that's lovely. And we want to thank you for all the people that have been involved. Some people have moved on, like Richard and family. Um, Charlie Groves, who was our first leader. And we thank you for those four pillars of um, worship, teaching, mercy, and unity. And we pray, Father God, that we will never lose, in a sense, our commitment as a church 
to uphold you central in our lives, individually, corporately, as families, and corporately as a larger church. And we pray for our parish. We pray for our wider church community to sort of cover over Cape Town, over our city, protection from this virus and protection of our faith in you. So today, as with every day, we give you huge thanks and praise and worship. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you for spending some time with us. That's a great pleasure. Anytime.